Hello and welcome to the first of our U3A radio podcasts, bringing you U3A news nationwide. Although there are now more than 1,000 U3A groups in the UK with over 400,000 members, most of these groups work in isolation. So the aim of this podcast is to share news and views on one platform, but also to encourage prospective members and potentially more U3As being set up in areas that don't currently have their own group. I'm Nick Bailey, and in the next 30 minutes, I'll announce the winners of the U3A Creative Writing Competition, and we'll hear about a group in Barnsley who call themselves the Writers of the Third Page. But if you're more into movies, there's a film club that's been set up in the Midlands with an idea that could easily spread around the country. As this is our first podcast, let's remind ourselves what the goal and values of U3A are. Here's Chief Executive Sam Morgan. So the U3A movement has a strap line, learn, laugh, live. And I feel that really encapsulates what the membership is all about. The members join to build communities of friendship and to have fun together. And fun is really at the heart of what the U3A is all about. Every member is valued for what they bring to that community. And everything and everybody is important. Whether you're running an advanced math session or a patchwork session, whether you're on a committee of a U3A or putting out chairs at a meeting. No matter who you are or what you do, you are important. That is what is at the heart of the U3A movement. It's all about ensuring everyone has a chance to contribute. Whatever they do, it's valued and it makes our community what it is. The chair of the organisation is Ian McKenna and Peter Clift asked how he thought the U3A had coped with the lockdown? Well, and until March, things were going along fairly smoothly. Uh, obviously, Mar- in March, we had COVID and it had a massive impact on the movement. Initially, U3As effectively closed down their operations while they tried to assess how to activate some activities. I think it's true to say that some U3As have been very, very innovative with some assistance from the trust in terms of ways that they can get their members active again but certainly over the last few months there have been many signs that U3As are using innovative ways to keep their members in touch with one another and U3A activities. Obviously this has fallen on the individual committees to take these initiatives but the Trust has been providing many examples of ways to to keep active and as lockdown has been eased somewhat then outdoor activities have started to take place such as walking groups Um, I think walking cricket has has started all subject to advice from the trust in terms of insurance and government governance guidance etc underlying all this and behind it has certainly been a big switch towards using virtual meetings but we've started to see meetings taking place uh, virtually Person, um, I'm in my own case, um, I'm a member of Barnet Youth Create and our history group, and I lead a history group there. And we've been operating since April uh, every fortnight on Zoom, and that seems to work very well. But there has been a downside to this because we do know from research and contacts with members that about 10%, maybe 15% of members do not have access to the internet, or they do, but they're not comfortable with using technology. So they have become more isolated than U3A members having access to the web. And certainly I know that some U3As have been very diligent in producing newsletters, printed newsletters, in addition to the the, um, virtual ones, that they've delivered to these members' houses and they've developed buddy systems to make sure that U3A members who are in an isolated, lonely position are contacted by other U3A members, possibly members of groups that they've been in. I think what, what's happened during the, the lockdown is that people have taken to Zoom and things, which rather lays to rest, as it were, the, the idea that U3A is old people, because I think we've proved, haven't we, that we, we're not like that at all. Moving forward, how do you see U3A after lockdown? Yes, I mean, I, I, um, I wrote uh, articles in the TAM in the early summer, June, and then in the monthly newsletters that go out to members that, that sign up to the monthly newsletter from the office, I asked them for their views on where the movement may be post-COVID. 
not surprisingly, given the nature of U3A members, I've received a lot of very thoughtful, detailed uh, views on where we would be post-COVID. And I have, have produced a report. It was made available through the August office newsletter, and it will also be available through a link in TAM in September. But I, the, the main points coming out of this, and of course there are many, many, many views, but I mean the key ones I think were that the longer this goes on, in other words, before lockdown, lockdown is, is lifted, and particularly a vaccine is, is available, there is concern that youth uh, three activity isn't likely to, to return to normal until such time as, as we have those conditions. It's, it's, it's difficult to see monthly meetings taking place until there is a vaccine and also meetings in homes over six people may be difficult. Certainly are, we are in a vulnerable age group. The average age of the youth ray is, is 74, having gone up about a couple of years in the last 10 years. So we are in a vulnerable age group. And, and, and the, the sense is, I think, that people in our generation will be more more reluctant to to get back to normal than other generations. And this will make an impact on, on the movement. Having said that, there are a lot of signs that youth raise are very, very anxious and their members very anxious to get activity going again. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are out outdoor meetings taking place, although of course, as winter comes that may be more difficult. There are a lot of interest groups that are being conducted online and that will continue through the winter although there is the sense that although zoom meetings are excellent and have kept people together that they're not a substitute for the social interaction and face-to-face -face meetings that are so central to the success of the U3A movement we could start to see hybrid meetings we could start to see some interest groups where members are willing to meet in homes but others are not so there could be, for example, a history group with 10 people in it, five of whom may be in, in a room if they feel comfortable in being in a, a room or a house, um, and the other five could be attending virtually. Technically, that would need a bit of handling by the host, but that's not impossible. So I, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, big desire <laughs> to get moving again, particularly amongst the older members. There will be some reluctance to, to go back to what we know as a norm. The other point that people have made quite powerfully is that unfortunately there will be people members of the public in their 50s and maybe early 60s that through no fault of their own may found themselves unemployed as a result of COVID. It, uh, their jobs have, have gone particularly if they're in tourism or hospitality and they may find it difficult to get jobs and, and U3A may be if, if U3As go out there and really promote themselves which we really, as a trust, we're encouraging them to have open days and go out to the wider community. It may be that uh, we do have an influx of younger members coming into the movement because of their, their own employment conditions. The U3A chair, Ian McKenna. Despite the lockdown, or maybe because of it, U3A launched a creative writing competition in April and winners were announced on the 10th of September. The idea was to find the best short story based on the theme of time, and there were over 340 entries. The overall winner was Rosemary Burton from Oxford with the story The Clock. Second place went to Penny Holland from Horncastle with There's a Time for Everything. And third place was awarded to Gillian Griffith from Much Wenlock for Time to Leave. We hope to speak to some of the winners in our next podcast. But in the meantime, if you want to read the winning entries, just go to the U3A website at u3a.org.uk. Someone who did enter the competition was Mac McKechnie from Barnsley, who during lockdown set up his own creative writing group. Ella Watts asked him how it worked. In essence, what I did was I set us a task, sending out a photograph on a Thursday a random photograph, the members of the group then had a week to write chapter one of the story. Then we would all vote the author of the week and that author of the week then we would all write chapter two of their chapter one for the following week. So it all worked in two week cycles. Then to add a bit of spice to that, I, I had a guest judge organised. 
So we, from within the U3A, and it started off within bounds of U3A. Uh, our chair was the first, I think. But that then moved to national office, and I got other people involved in national office. On Facebook, the group came alive, which was around about keeping in touch. So I put a bit of a note on there. Anybody that wished to join Bowsy U3A writing group was more than welcome to do so. Just contact me. And indeed, we went international, and our furthest member lives away in Knox in Australia. The group has grown, and the group is now steady, and just about maximum capacity is about 15 members in the group. And that's, that's how we, we all work. Several of the group members have said that when lockdown is finished and UFA gets back to normal, whatever normal is, then they will still remain with the group and become members of Bowser U3A Creative Writing Group. How the name came about was, I got fed up of writing Bowser U3A Creative Writing Group, brackets, two brackets. So we then had a bit of a contest between us to determine a new name for the group. We wound up being Writers of the Third Page, which seemed an interesting title. So does that sort of answer that for you? It, it does answer that. You know, when, when we do get back to the new sort of whatever normal is, as you say, <laughs> will you maintain it as an online group? Almost certainly. That, that's my intention. And I need then to sort of work with my own local chair and the committee at Barnsley. I also want to mix it with normal meetings because the interaction face-to-face, you can't replace that. But I'm not too bothered about that because my own interpretation of most creative writing groups that I know about or I've seen is everybody writes something, you go to a meeting, you all sit down and you read your stories. And I'm thinking, well, why? No, that doesn't seem very logical to me. Maybe I haven't got a logical brain, but uh, I, I, I can't grasp the concept of me writing something and reading it out aloud to the group members. I can't think of anything more boring than listening to me about myself. Where reading it online is so much simpler. And I think we can talk about other things in, in, in group meetings. I see the way forward is having a core group of Barnsley people, about five or six of us, meeting once a fortnight, as we already planned to do in the first place, but then expanding that to have a Zoom meeting, possibly at that meeting, and not actually read out stories, but talk about you know, the future, what we're going to do, and all sorts of other interesting stuff. We'll also include things like flash writing. People give me a sentence and say, right, I've got 10 minutes to write something on that and see what, you know, all that sort of stuff. You'll end up doing a, a Dungeons and Dragons type scenario where one person comes up with one phrase and then the next person carries yes. on the story. Fabulous. Absolutely. Now, there's a knock-on effect to this because uh, I, I never saw myself uh, as a writer. I've always felt there's been a book in me. Since lockdown, I've, I've written a series of science fiction books under my pen name of Rogan Collingwood. As part of this, um, what we're doing is looking at a photograph and writing a chapter. I actually did one which turned into a bit of a children's story, something I never ever thought about, although I, I am a granddad and I've lots of grandkids scattered about. I've spent a lot of time over the last sort of two months preparing a children's book for publication. The hard part of that was getting a local illustrator to work with me to actually do the drawings uh, that need to accompany the story. I found one, and she's a superb illustrator, and that will be in paperback form in the next three weeks. I <laughs> uh, shall so keep my eye open for that one. Called The Red Kite by Mac McKechnie. That's super. So for me, that's been um, a good exercise in self-discipline and all the rest. But I guess during lockdown, that's relatively easy to do because all the other stuff I used to do, I can't really you can't really do anymore. The science fiction ones that you've written, did you say, yes. were, did you say there were four? Yes, there is. Race to Oberon. The last one is called Race to Nowhere, which is interesting in itself. Now, are these full novels? They're, they're four short science fiction novels, which, if you like, are very closely linked. 
four characters going to uh, become officers at space school and, and it's their adventures in space. Have you encouraged any of your other members to become published authors themselves? Yeah, absolutely. And I know that quite a few of us entered the recent U3A uh, creative writing competition Right. And I got my letter last week, didn't we? Oh, but there we go. The way we work in our group is voting for the author of the week. I've only won it twice. <laughs> you know, everybody gets something different from a story. It, quite often, we, you know, we're all voting for the one we like the best. And in a week, we can have five different people that people like the best. Every week's different. And, but it does keep people on the toes and people are keen to do the best. We all want to be author of the week if we can. It's good for us in the group. I think it's amazing to have set this up at such a time and have a completely online organised group and I hope your novels are very successful as well. I, out of the blue I got my first royalty check this week. As an author getting your royalty check is a wonderful thing indeed but I don't think I'm going to be a millionaire. I don't think £35 will cover that but you've got to start somewhere. Of course if Mac could sell the film rights for one of his books who knows what he could earn. It could even be part of a new film study group, which has been started up by Paul Martinez, a member of the Carlton in Gedling U3A in Nottingham. Peter Cliff wanted to know how it came about. Really, it's actually a, an innovation uh, inspired by the lockdown. Um, uh, you know, some of our groups weren't able to function uh, very easily or indeed at all. So we, we, we sort of thought, had a big think about what could we do new or differently. Uh, and uh, we'd never had a film group before, partly because we've got a very active theatre group and a very active opera group. Uh, and we didn't really get around to having a film group. But um, it sort of occurred to me that we might be able to help organize a film group by looking at films that are available on free streaming platforms and um, you know iplayer or all fall or whatever and then uh, the the value of the group would be in in uh, in agreeing which films that we would all watch together uh, and also having a meeting every couple of weeks to discuss the film that we've just seen and agree which film we were going to see in the future and the other thing that we decided to do was that rather than just sort of have no, in a way, no, <laughs> no criteria for, for film selection. Uh, we thought we, we'd have two streams. So one would be classic films, so films that are significant in the history of the development of cinema, and the other would be a fairly contemporary film. Um, and ironically, the classic films are quite easy to access, uh, whereas some of the contemporary films, especially the most contemporary films, are really quite difficult to get find. But we thought it was important to um, not have an extra barrier. Or we wanted to keep it you know, as, as accessible as possible. So, I mean, how do you, how do you choose both the classic and the, the modern films? Is there any well, I, the, I have to confess, <laughs> I, I suggest a range of options. Actually, quite a few of the films that we've seen haven't really, you know, they may have only been seen by one or two people out of the 14 or 15 who attend our meetings. And so they're generally a rather unknown quantity. So I, I give us a little synopsis and then we, then we have a vote. Do you have any background in film industry? Or? No, none at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a complete amateur. <laughs> and, and the same for the mem you, members of your group, I guess. They don't. I'm afraid so. <laughs> so, in, in a sense, I'm going to say the, the films are, when I say random, I mean, do you, do you kind of choose a, a genre or do you choose a genre? Um, we, we do try and vary, uh, vary the, especially the contemporary films. I mean, there's such a huge amount of, of, of film to, to choose from. So we do try and have a fairly, fairly varied, mi varied mixture. Uh, in terms of the classic films, I mean, we actually started off uh, right at the very beginnings of cinema with a couple of Melies uh, short films and then we've been gradually moving forward in time. Uh, we've got up to about 1925 now. <laughs> what, what's the kind of the feedback? Is it generally a very good discussion? And well, the best, uh, the best feedback is, 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 you know, whether people want to keep watching the films and, and, and coming to the meetings. And I think what the sort of things that people have said are that they, what they get out of it is since widening the range of films that they've watched, because sometimes they're, they're watching films that they've never even heard of. The opportunity to, to discuss films with colleagues and friends uh, from the U3A. And, and also, it does change the way that you watch a film if you know that you're going to be discussing it. You do watch it more attentively rather than sort of slumping, well, as I usually do in front of the television, sort of letting the film <laughs> wash over me. Um, uh, so I, I, I think, that, I suppose the other thing is that 
Um, although they, we haven't really been going long enough, we've had about, what, I don't know, four or five meetings. But I mean, hopefully, uh, as the months progress, and I, and I think we'll keep this format, you know, even if the cinemas were all to, all to open tomorrow without any restrictions, I think we keep this format because it's actually a very convenient way of, of accessing film. I mean, yes, you don't get the, quite the thrill of being in a cinema, but on the other hand, it's a lot cheaper. Paul Martinez with yet another example of how U3A members have used lockdown to start up new groups. It's something that's impressed Chief Executive Sam Morga as she's travelled around the country. It's the enthusiasm that people have in, in what they're doing. The fact that everyone is uh, so valued that they want to share. I mean, U3A members are fantastic at sharing with each other what they're doing and they're proud of what they're doing. I think the other thing is that people encourage each other to take part and that that's absolutely great and I've come across stories where people have said I never thought I'd be doing this thing there was one gentleman who said I, I used to be a mechanic and I joined the U3A because my friend kept come along come along I went to a poetry talk I got absolutely hooked on poetry and if anybody told me I'd be running poetry workshops for groups of you know 50 60 people I would have thought they were mad but here I am now doing something I thought I'd never do. And I think it really encapsulates what the East Ray is all about. It actually encourages people to find new opportunities and you know, different skills within themselves that they never thought that they would ever be doing. And members encourage each other. I think that's what's so great. So what's the future of U3A post-COVID? A question Peter Clift put to the chair, Ian McKenna. Well, I, I suppose if I, if I was asked this question before COVID, I would, I would say that it would continue to develop in the way that it has done in the past. And it's been a very successful movement. Uh, it is slightly aging in terms of membership. The, the num number of new people are, um, the rate of increase is, is not as great as it was. But we did have a development plan that was announced last year after a two-year consultation with members. And, and there were there were certain issues that came out of this consultation. One of them was that we would we would take focus on U3A as opposed to University of the Third Age. The, there was a very very strong feeling, as there has been for about fifteen to twenty years, that the term University of the Third Age, although it's it, we we have a heritage and we have to honour the vision of our founders, it can be it can be a, a, a term that makes some people. Not want, not feel comfortable in joining the U3. If they got over that barrier, uh, they would find that it was a very, very social, educational movement uh, to join. So we focused on on U3A. And the other thing that we realise is that we have grown essentially through word of mouth, friends recommending their friends to U3A. So we have a plan at the moment, and it, and it's going ahead, at, irrespective of COVID, to try and bring the U3A as a movement to the attention of the media, social media, the, and the, um, the print media. And we're trying to establish a, a coalition of common interest and trying to partner with organizations, charities, companies, etc., that have the same vision that we have about promoting learning into the third age of life. To try and answer your question, we're trying to broaden the publicity of the movement to make it wide and far more wider known than it is at the moment. The other thing is, I think that as a result of COVID, we will start to see more use of the internet and virtual meetings. One thing that uh, has resulted out of COVID is we've formed Trust U3A, and it's basically a U3A, but only on the net. And it was originally set up because we were getting interest from the public in March and April, wanting to join a U3A, but and they were not able to join it because it was closed. And so we, we set up the U3A, Trust U3A, so that they, members of the public could join a U3A, expert, experience interest groups, and then would go to back, would, would uh, join a local U3A at the end of lockdown. Now, what's emerged over the last few months is that there is a demand for this type of U3A, uh, and it will continue in, in some form or other post-lockdown. And the thing that's coming out of it is that one third of the members of Trust U3 are existing U3 members. They're leading about 30 interest groups. We have about 300 members altogether, 200 members of, of the public, 100 existing U3 members. And it's clear that 
there is a demand for a, a youth VA that cuts across boundaries. So it doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. We're even getting people from overseas wanting to, to be members. It, may be, it, it could be attractive to people that, even though they're, they're close to a youth VA, can't physically get to it because they're caring or they have a physical disability. People that are interested in linking up with people in other parts of the country, like a current affairs group or whatever, a language group. Break, so it breaks down the, the, the geographical barriers that limit the U3A as it stands at the moment. Now, this is not going to be any replacement for the existing U3A, but it would add a new dimension to it. The other thing is people are saying, well, you know, U3As don't operate in the evenings and, uh, and winters, winter nights are lonely and uh, weekends can be lonely and nothing happens in U3A at the weekends. Well, U3A is not limited by time or day. So we won't go there, as they say, but I'm sure we could have an hour long debate on the, the old problem of U3A versus University of the Third Age, because that's been going on for, for a long, long time. But I, I think what is interesting is what you, you've said I'd like to pick up on is the, the idea that moving into things like the, the trust U3A, uh, the whole idea of, of social media, a year, two years time, the U3A then will be different to, to the U3A that we've, we've known. Well, last year at the, at the AGM, um, when I announced the results of the development plan, which was this consultation with members, the, 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 there were some key themes, and, and one was focusing on our name and resolving that long-standing debate over 20 years. The other one was, as, as I said, to try and get our, spread the word more. We're a bit of a hidden, hidden gem. Now, there, there, there are people in the movement that feel that that's not necessary uh, and that we, we're very strong and, and vibrant as we are. But the point I made a year ago was that all organisations, in all, we look at our lifetime in every aspect of our life, the high street, travel, printing, every aspect of life, even a year ago, was changing rapidly. And those organisations that did not adapt to change, we suddenly wake up in the morning and we find they, they've gone bankrupt or they've closed down or they disappeared. And they mainly disappeared because they did not adapt. And the attempt of the measures we were taking last year and are still taking was to try and position the next generation so that the next generation can enjoy what our generation has enjoyed. The chair of U3A, Ian McKenna, looking forward. But the final word is with Chief Executive Sam Morgan, who shares Ian's sentiments. Well, the way I see it is that the membership has really stretched itself as a result of, uh, of the pandemic. While we know that the value of face-to-face -face meetings is at its core and its foundation, the value of being able to reach out to people who can't attend meetings has also been demonstrated and we've used that opportunity. Having talked to people within the U3As, many of them are saying that they'll continue to use the technology in future, whether it's to meet other members across long distances whether it's to include people who can't get out because of mobility or because of caring responsibilities, they'll still continue to use technology in the right places. And they'll do that to make sure they can share the resources that they create and their ideas uh, with each other and include people wherever they are and whatever they're doing. And I think the other thing we found is during lockdown, we've been joined by new people who are looking for friendship, for something interesting to do and also where their age is irrelevant, and it's the person that counts. I think that's really at the heart of the U3A. And so what we're going to do is continue to extend our message to offer membership to those people who find themselves in the position of facing quite major change right now at this time of their lives, maybe because some of them have been made redundant or they've had enforced early retirement, and look forward to welcoming them into the U3A community. It's an opportunity to bring that the warmth and the friendship to people who might really be looking for those kind of communities right now. The U3A really shows the value of a community of interest and in doing an interesting thing. That's not defined by their past experience, but instead by the experiences still to come and still to be explored. And we feel that's really what the U3A is all about. Sam Morga ending our first U3A radio podcast. The first of many, I hope. But to make it work, we need your input. Apart from groups news, we're looking for interesting people to talk to about their lives before U3A for a series of people profiles. 
Most people have a story to tell, so don't be shy in coming forward. Or maybe you'd like to nominate someone. If so, let us know at communications at u3a.org.uk. That's communications at u3a.org.uk. Before I go, let me thank our interviewers, Peter Clift and Ella Watts, with additional credit to Ella for also producing the podcast. Until next time, this is Nick Bailey saying goodbye.